when Paul introduces this topic, he introduces this military language of the armor of God. And this may seem a little jarring. You remember where we've been in this text? We've been in this text just a few verses earlier talking about how husbands and wives ought to love each other and how parents should love their children and how children should honor their parents. And, and then masters and slaves, we talked about the workplace and how employers and employees ought to actually be serving each other. And so in that context, Paul then drops this armor of the God language, this military language. Seems a little jarring, seems a little bit out of nowhere, doesn't it? That Paul would drop armor of God language as we've been talking about relationships. But what Paul knows here is that if we are to walk out our salvation at home, in our marriages, in our parenting, in our workplace, if we are to walk it out, then we're going to face opposition. There is going to be attack against that. Think right now of the conflicts you've had, even recently, or maybe in the past, conflicts with your spouse, conflicts with your kids, conflicts with your parents, conflicts with your coworkers, your boss, your employees. Think about those conflicts. Have you ever considered that the devil may be behind some of that? That the devil may be taking advantage of the vulnerabilities in your relationships and just pushing, nudging, taking advantage, getting a foothold, as scripture says, in those relationships? Have you, have you thought about that? Have you considered that the devil is behind um, the strategy of your conflicts. Now, as I, as I prayed, it's not for us to get freaked out and scared and to run into a corner and hide. That's not the point of this. Paul is not bringing this up to scare us. But Paul does want us not to underestimate the work of the evil one. He doesn't want us to be naive as if we are just going through life and there is no realm of spiritual darkness that is working against the purposes of God, in particularly in his church. So he wants us to understand that. And it shouldn't be a surprise to us if we go all the way back to creation. We see Adam and Eve, and where does Satan first appear? He's putting a wedge between Adam and Eve. He is coming up and supplanting Adam as the spiritual leader in this marriage. And he's coming up and speaking on Adam's, real, on Adam's behalf. And he is saying, this is who God is. And this is what God has really said. And this is what God is really like. God's petty. God's jealous. God doesn't want you to be like him. So he's holding back on you. That's where Satan came in. It was to create conflict in a marriage. And so it shouldn't surprise us that this is the work that Satan wants to do even today. Creating conflict in that marriage then led to a conflict between their sons. It was Cain who killed Abel. And then it created a conflict in work. When we see the curse of that resulted, we see that Adam was going to have to deal with work, and it was going to be hard. Work was going to be fraught with futility and fraught with thorns and thistles and all of that, all because Satan just made his way into a relationship. So it shouldn't surprise us, should it? It shouldn't surprise us that this is what Satan is continuing to do today. It's important that we're aware of this very aware of this. So let's consider two things today, and then we'll uh, keep it going next, next time. Two things. One, let's consider our opponent, and let's consider the strategy to win against him, okay? The opponent and the strategy. First, the opponent. When you think about the devil, you might think of some caricatures from movies. There's a lot in our world when it comes to movies and TV shows about Satan or evil forces. Just think about the number of TV shows that are out there celebrating almost this evil. There's, there's a show literally called Lucifer, right? Literally called Lucifer. 
But you might have in your mind some, some caricatures where Satan is dressed up in horns and he's got a pitchfork and he's red and he maybe looks like a lizard with sharp teeth. Or you might have in your mind um, Jack Nicholson or Al Pacino, Devil's Advocate. You might have those kinds of pictures in your mind of, of the devil or like Chucky, you know, <laughs> just... Um, you might have kind of really like sophisticated views of him, or you might have like really warped demonic views of him. Satan would love for us to have mischaracterizations of him. He would love that. And he would love for us to either be naive about how he, how he influences our day-to-day -day life, or he would love for us to overestimate his influence on our day-to-day -day life as well. And we see that in the church, don't we? In, in church, Big C Church, there are pockets of the church that, that just believe the devil is behind every corner, laying out every trap, and he is ready to bind us into some sort of bondage at every level. And, and that, kind of, that kind of thinking um, gives Satan too much credit. And Satan loves that. He loves that. Give him too much credit. Because what, what that results in is you will be paralyzed. You won't think you have a shot against Satan. And so you won't look at Paul's first instruction, which is be strong in the Lord, right? You won't think you can be strong in the Lord. You won't ever be strong enough if Satan is laying a trap for you in every direction and ready to bind you up you won't be strong in the Lord. And that's exactly what Satan would love for you to do. Overestimate him so you won't be ever thinking you could be strong enough. Or you can underestimate him. If you underestimate him, then you're thinking, I don't need to be strong in the Lord. Why do I need to be strong in the Lord if he's not really affecting my life that much? And that's exactly where Satan would love for you to be too. He would love to, for you to either overestimate him so you're not strong in the Lord or underestimate him so you don't need to be strong in the Lord. Either one works for him. What Paul does is he says, no, be strong in the Lord. And right there that tells us, one, he's a worthy opponent. We need to be strong in the Lord, right? Right? But it also tells us, too, he's an opponent that we can withstand if we are strong in the Lord. If you're strong in the Lord, you can succeed. You can. You can stand. You can. That's what we learn from just that one phrase, be strong in the Lord. It gives us a wonderful, accurate, balanced view of how we actually ought to see our opponent, the devil. So do you, which, where do you lean? Do you feel like you're a little too naive? about the enemy and therefore not really leaning on the strength of the Lord? Or do you feel like you see Satan under every rock and he's about to pounce on you and you're intimidated so that you don't ever think you could be strong enough in the Lord? Which, think for yourself, which of those two do you feel you err on? So the, the opponent that we are facing here is is out for the church. He's out for the church. And if we look at where Paul has already talked about the enemy, he's talked a lot about the enemy in this letter. So let's re recount what Satan's deal is about the church. If we go back to Ephesians 2, 6, Paul says this, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages, he might show the uncomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Paul has in mind that our very existence as the church is going to demonstrate something for all ages. And it's going to demonstrate the incomparable riches of the grace of God. Now, who is he demonstrating this to? 
Who are we demonstrating the incredible grace of God to? It's to every spiritual force in all of creation, including the demonic ones. We are demonstrating, you as the church of Jesus Christ, you are demonstrating that Satan doesn't have a hold on certain people. He did have a hold on people. If you look at it earlier in chapter two, he, it says that all of us who were unbelievers, we were just following the ruler of this age, right? Just following along. And Satan didn't really have to worry about us when we we're unbelievers. We're just following along. We're just going along with the playbook. We, he didn't have to really pursue us all that hard because we were just following along, following along. That's the world. And Satan has unbelievers in that captivity. They are bound to his playbook to reject and rebel against God, to do life on our own, to reject God as good and try to be our own God. We're just following along, following along until, verse 4 of chapter 2, God, but God, rich in his mercy, made us alive in Christ and freed us from following the playbook of, of the evil one. So now we have been freed from Satan's grip because we've been placed in, in heavenly places in Christ to demonstrate the lavish grace of God to the one who used to hold us, to the one who we followed before. So how does Satan feel about that? <laughs> he hates that. And so guess what? You, you probably weren't so much in his crosshairs before, but now you are, because you represent to him in all spiritual darkness that Humanity does not have to be held by him. Amen? Amen? Yeah, I don't know if you ever thought about your salvation that way, but your salvation is demonstrating the grace of God to the devil and his, his forces. All right? And he's not happy about that. One more verse that we've seen in, in chapter 3, verse 10. His intent, God's intent, was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Through the church, we are demonstrating the manifold wisdom of God to the enemy. I don't know if you thought about your purpose that way, but that's part of our purpose. God's purpose was that our very existence would show the wisdom of God, where Satan thought he had the Son of God nailed, dead, killed on a cross. He thought he had outsmarted God, and in God's great wisdom, he outsmarted the enemy by raising Jesus from the dead, and so taking the very tool that the enemy had against us. He defeated that tool. He defeated death. So where is your stinger death? It's gone. That's the wisdom of God. And we who are the church, when we believe in Jesus, we are also raised with Jesus so that we can demonstrate to Satan, yep, death has no hold on us, which means you have no hold on us either. God outsmarted you. You demonstrate that. You, the church, demonstrate that God outsmarted the enemy. So he's not happy about it. <laughs> okay, so why the opposition? That's why. You demonstrate the grace of God. You demonstrate the wisdom of God, and it's in his face. It's in his face. There has been a decisive blow against the enemy. Now, I don't know if you guys watched the uh, Patriots-Bills game yesterday, um, but the Patriots got decimated. Um, the halftime score, I think we turned it on at halftime. The halftime score was 27 to 3 at half. The Bills were over the Patriots. Now, when you got a score like that, you're pretty much able to just turn the TV off and you know, do something else because you know how that game's going to go. 
right? A decisive blow had been laid against the patriots. They're not coming back from that. They're not. And the end of this, at the end of the game, I think it was 47 to 13, right? But here's the thing. They still have to play. They have to play a whole second half. So they play the second half. The game goes on. But we already know a decisive blow has been made. So that's an analogy of what has happened with Satan, right? Decisive blow made. Halftime score, God, a million. Satan, zero, right? Took away death. Defeated the enemy. But we got to keep playing the game. So we're going to keep playing the game, and he's going to keep coming at us. But he knows he's coming at us as one who's been defeated, as one who's been dealt a terrible blow, one that he is never able to overcome. But he's going to keep coming. That's the point. He's going to keep coming. So that's why we have this opposition. But we, again, we have this opposition as people who have been decisively on the side of the victor, right? We are seated in Christ in heavenly realms over all authorities, over all powers. That's our vantage point. That's where we're living from. So when you are doing marriage or you're doing parenting or you're, you're a worker in your workplace, you are doing all of that from the vantage point of one who's been seated in, in heavenly places, someone who is with Jesus who has been victorious over the enemy. So when the enemy comes at us, do we need to fear? Do we need to be paralyzed? Do we need to withdraw? Do we need to check out? Do we, no, not at all. We are doing parenting as those seated in Christ. We are doing marriage as those seated in Christ. We're in the workplace as those seated in Christ. And that makes all the difference. So he's going to come at us. The opponent's going to come at us. And the opponent, the devil, the devil diabolus, literally means slander, liar. He's going to come at us and he's going to say, oh, you think you're seated in heavenly places? And he's going to point out our sin. And he's going to point out our failures. He's going to point out our past. He's going to say, how on earth do you think you, you, can be victorious over your past, over yourself. And what's our response? What's our response? Our response is not, oh, no, you're not right. Our response is, you're right. You are right. We have sinned. We've fallen short of the glory of God, and we have failed. But don't look at me. Look at him. I'm with him, right? I'm with Jesus. I'm with the one who took my sin on the cross and paid everything that was owed for it. So now there's no debt on my account. Look at him. You're right. I've sinned, but that's gone. It's gone because of him. And he says, I'm with him. That's good enough for me. So every time Satan comes at us, he's going to come at us and he's going to say, who do you think you are? He's going to come at us and he's going to slander us. He's going to accuse us. That's what he does. And when we do, what do we say? We're not to say, you know, well, I'm, I'm still a good person compared to most people. I'm, I'm okay. No, that defense is not going to work at all. The only thing we can say is you're right, but I have a great savior. Go to him. You, you have an issue with me, go to him, right? That's what we do in the face of it. When, when Watchman Nee uh, gave a commentary on, on Ephesians, he summed up what the believers to do in three actions. One, we're to sit, we're to walk, and we're to stand. We're to sit, we're to walk, we're to stand. What does it mean to sit? We're to say, hey, I am seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're to sit in the identity that we have as God's redeemed, God's beloved. We are saints. We are the inheritance of God. We're to sit in that, sit in all of that. Satan wants to come and say, oh, yeah, just the way he came to Jesus. Remember in the wilderness in Luke chapter four, Satan comes to Jesus. And what's his first words? 
if you are the son of God, because just before that, he had heard the father in the waters of baptism open up the heavens and say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then the spirit drives him into the wilderness where he hears Satan say back to him, if you are the son of God, Satan is going to attack us when we're trying to sit in who we are in Christ. That's what he does. That's his strategy. But we're also called to walk, right? Paul uses that word walk five times in, in Ephesians in that little section where he says, walk in unity, walk in holiness, walk in love, walk in light, walk in wisdom, walk, meaning obey, live out what God has called you to be as his redeemed, beloved children. Walk it out. So what is Satan going to do? He's going to tempt us into disobedience. He's going to tempt us to stop walking. He's going to tempt us to not pursue unity or love or light or wisdom. He's going to tempt us in all those ways. Because when we sit in who we are, when we walk out the salvation, we are demonstrating to him and the whole, all the spiritual realms, the grace and the wisdom of God. So he's going to attack us where we sit. He's going to attack us where we walk. That's his strategy. And, and then the last thing that we're going to explore in this text is what it means to stand. What it means to stand. And we're to stand in the strength of the Lord. And this is the strategy. The strategy part is Paul saying, be strengthened in the Lord. Be strengthened in the Lord. And that's how he starts. That's that first verse in verse 10 says, finally, be strong in the Lord. That might sound like, hey, get your act together. You know, be strong. Fuck up. Let's go. Right. That's not what Paul is saying. It's actually in the passive plural, meaning, hey, y'all, plural, y'all be strengthened in the Lord, y'all, okay? I just like saying y'all. Um, but everyone, all of you together, all of you be strengthened, passively receive, not just passively though, but you are standing, you have to stand. And you're only gonna stand when you're strengthened in the Lord. You have to be actively strengthened in the Lord, receiving from the Lord. And then he says how later on, when he says you put on the armor of God you put it on. When you put on the armor of God, you will be strengthened in the Lord. So this strength that you need does not come from inside of you. This strength that you need comes from outside of you. It comes externally to you. That's the only way we get strength. We get it from the Lord. And how do we get that strength from the outside to the inside? We get that strength when we put on the armor of God. But the wonderful thing about this phrase, be strong in the Lord, he's only echoing where we sit, right? Because in chapter one, where are you? You are in him. I mean, just turn there, would you? Um, Ephesians chapter one, let's just go through this real quick as a, a refresher. Ephesians chapter one, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. Do you get the point? That's where you're sitting. We're in him. Because everything that God does, all of his activity, if it's choosing forgiveness, redemption, all of that is because we're in him. He's placed us 
in him. It is through our union with Jesus Christ that we can be strong in the Lord. Praise God. You don't have to do this on your own. You can't. You can't fight this opponent on your own. So when you think about the conflicts that you're in or you've been in and the ways that you've dealt with them, you can't deal with that on your own. If there's an enemy who's behind it, if there's an enemy poking at your most vulnerable places, trying to stoke you to do to get out the worst self that you are, when you've got an enemy who's doing that with you, you cannot do that. You can't respond on your own, right? You can't. None of us can. So the strategy, be strong in the Lord. Be strengthened in the Lord. And again, it's passive plural. Be strengthened in the Lord means we don't fight alone. We can't fight alone. We are together in this fight, together, strengthened in the Lord. And I just want to close with this. One of the beautiful things about the church is that we can pray for one another that we would be strengthened in the Lord. I want to close with um, chapter 1, verse 18. After Paul has talked about all of the glorious truths of our position in Christ, he then says, he then prays. And let this be a prayer that you pray or that you ask others to pray for you. When you're going and you're hitting the opposition, you're feeling the weight of conflict, you feel like you're in the crosshairs, let this be our default response. Call someone up and say, I need you to pray for me. And this is what I need you to pray. Ephesians 1.18, I pray that the eyes of your hearts may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. I pray, I pray that my brother, my sister would know the incomparably great power that has decisively dealt a blow to the enemy and has seated us in heavenly places with our victorious king. I pray that our eyes would be opened, that our hearts would be opened. I pray my brother and sister would see it, would know it, would experience it right now, that my brother and my sister won't lean on her own understanding, that my brother and my sister won't depend on his own resources, but will wholly lean on the power that is available in Christ because my brother in, or, and my sister is in Jesus. In Jesus, I pray that prayer. When you're going through it, you need to have certain people on your speed dial, right? Your top five on your speed dial should be people who are gonna pray that prayer for you when you're feeling it, and you know when you're feeling, it. you know, deep inside of your heart, you know those times when you just feel like, wow, there's a weight of opposition here. There is some heaviness that I'm experiencing here. There is some pushback that's on another level here. When you're experiencing that, speed dial. Call somebody up and say, I need you to pray. I need you to pray right now because there's something going on. There's some opposition happening in my marriage right now. There's some opposition happening with my kids right now or, or with my parents right now or in my workplace right now. I need you to pray and pray this prayer. Help me to see the power that I have in Christ. Help me to see where I sit and help me to walk in the power of Jesus. So I wonder today, have you been naive? Have you been a little ignorant, maybe dismissive of, you know, Satan? I mean, in our culture today, Satan is kind of dismissed as this pre-modern myth. Like he's some, 
you know, I, I was, I'm teaching ancient history to uh, the kids and, you know, we just started talking about Socrates and in, in Greece and Socrates was novel because up to that point, up to that point, people explained the world pretty much through the metaphysical. Here's a God for, the, you know, good crops. Here's the God for good lands. Here's a God for for um, pleasure here's a god for you know and if you mess with this god then he's going to come back at you so everything was all explained through the metaphysical there was a god for everything and then socrates came along and he said wait a minute we can think we can use our minds we can start rationalizing if we think about okay let's let's think about a better way to get water into our city let's think about you know let's not just lean on the, the god of water or the god of buildings let's lean on our own minds and then what did we do in the enlightenment we ran with that everything became rational everything became about reason everything could be explained away by psychology or explained away by sociology or or anyology if we just think about it and this has gotten into our thinking as the church the church has also gotten that rationalistic thinking about evil in the world. And so we rationalize things rather than actually acknowledging that there is a personal evil one who is in opposition to the things of God and has his church in its crosshairs. We need to be aware of that. We need to be, we need to own that. So have you been a little naive about it? And if so, how do you need to be strengthened in the Lord? How do you need to lean on Jesus this week? How do you need others to be praying for you so that you don't go in ignorant of the, the schemes of the enemy, but that you go in depending on Jesus, aware that he's, at, he's, he's coming at you? How do you do that? Wonderful thing that we have to do right now is to go to the table of the Lord where the decisive blow was dealt. And here we go to the foot of the cross and we look up and see the Savior who defeated our worst enemy, who defeated the power of sin, who defeated the power of Satan, defeated the power of death by giving of himself in his lavish grace and kindness. God looked at us when we were following the ruler of this air and had every right to let us just go our own way, to let us go astray and look at an eternity without him, look at an eternity of judgment. It would have been completely just for God to do that. But God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. He took away the one tool that Satan had. So we could be free in Christ. That's where we sit. That's where we sit. So let us rem be reminded of where we sit. We sit in the one who is victorious, who is at the right hand of the Father over all authorities and over all powers. It's because of what he did by going to the cross. So I want to invite you today to just be in this moment of reflection and prayer before the Lord inviting his power, the power of the cross into your life so that you can walk in him and live in him.